Good morning, friends, and welcome to this celebration of worship of God with Union Congregational United Church of Christ. We're glad that you're with us, both those of you who are here in the sanctuary and those of you who are online. For those of you who are online, we encourage you to follow along if you received a worship bulletin in your email. If you didn't receive one, we encourage you to send an email to office at unionucc.com to be added to our distribution list. If you have questions during the service, feel free to drop a comment into the feed and our online usher will assist you. If you're a visitor, we encourage you to fill out one of the visitor cards found in your pews, place it in an offering plate, and see an usher after worship to receive one of our yellow welcome packets and a jar of our welcome cookie mix. If you'd like to make a pledge or an offering, you may do so by placing it in the offering baskets, mailing it to the church office at 716 South Madison Street, 54301, or by going to unionucc.com and clicking on the Giving tab. All are invited to gather upstairs in the church hall following worship for refreshments and conversation. That can be reached through the doors to my left and either up the stairs or up the elevator. Thank you to Occam and Kathy Seifert for bringing treats today. We could use a couple of people to duck out after or, the, or in the midst of the final hymn to help with a little bit of setup. And of course, many hands always make light work with the cleanup. Also at Union Central is a sign up to provide soup for our Maundy Thursday Agape meal. I think we're looking for one more soup provider for that and a sign up for our Easter breakfast, both of which will be here before we know it. The Easter breakfast, I think they're looking now mostly for sweet treats, fruit, that kind of thing. Um, and of course, help with setup and clean up for that. Both of those sign ups are at Union Central, which is the, uh, the information table just inside the church doors, again, right at the top of the stairs. Please join us this coming week for the, our celebrations of Holy Week. Thursday, March 28th, will be at 6 p.m. in the church hall with a light meal as part of our agape meal. That will not be streamed because of it being upstairs in the church hall. Friday the 29th, we will have a tenebrae service, which tenebrae is a Latin word for a service of the shadows. That will be 7 p.m. here in the sanctuary, and that is live streamed. On Easter Sunday, we will have an 8 a.m. service in the chapel with communion. Again, chapel, not streamed. But then 10 a.m., our festive Easter celebration will be streamed here from the chancel. After Easter, the Joshua spiritual leaders are initiating a big read of a new book by, a, by the president of Sojourners, Adam Russell Taylor. The big read is a book called A More Perfect Union, and it is an attempt to help us to come together as a nation and to fight Christian nationalism, one of the, the scourges of our day. The, um, We'll be launching that on April 4th, which is the anniversary of the martyrdom of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. So um, go ahead now and order your books of A More Perfect Union, and then in your church communications, watch for the, um, the announcements of when we will have different discussions and Zooms of um, the, that book. Because we tried to limit the announcements on Easter, I'll also call out to your attention that we've moved several offerings from the first Sunday of April to the second, most notably our celebration of communion, and therefore our monthly blessing box food drive and our card ministry, both of which are efforts to extend the ripples of our experience of communion. Again, those three efforts will be moved to April 14th. Lastly, I'd remind the children among us that you're invited to gather in the narthex right now to be able to be leaders in our palm procession. If any children would like to gather in the narthex, please do so. Would anyone else have any joys, concerns, or ministry opportunities you'd like to lift up? Jamie, an usher can bring you a microphone. Hmm. There we go. Here, Tim's coming with a microphone.
I just want to remind everyone and invite everyone um, to the intergenerational game night this Wednesday in the church hall. Um, it is a sponsorship, a co-sponsorship between um, our outreach ministry and the, um, the uh, Pride Center of Northeast Wisconsin. And it's a wonderful time from 6 till 7.30 to um, share in card games, board games, the, and the like. So uh, if you're free and you would like to join us, um, please do so. Uh, we only ask that you enter uh, the building through the courtyard entrance, which is to the right here. Thank you. Thanks, Jamie. Other joys, concerns, or ministry opportunities folks would like to lift up? Kathy. This morning, we received funds from Wild Ones Green Bay to convert a section of our garden to a native bio hedge. And they took our picture and they gave us some signs and we're looking forward to the future. Thank you, and thanks to the Wild Ones of Green Bay for that. <coughs> With that as our common purpose, then I invite you to turn to your bulletins and join together in the bond of union. Giving our all as we have been given all, we accept the religion of love and service which Jesus lived and taught, and declare it our purpose to strive to do the will of God and to make the Christ spirit dominant in our lives and in all human relations. Friends, please rise as you are able and join in our call to worship. We gather today preparing ourselves for a week that is holy, yet filled with unholy words, thoughts, and deeds. In this week of journey, some people lose their way. In this week of betrayal, others find hope hidden in their hearts. We will try to follow Jesus in the days to come, sustained by the word of grace and life. Joining the children, we wave palm branches with joy, despite keeping nails at the ready in case we are tempted to use them. The one who set aside glory comes in humility. The one who offers life will challenge death itself. Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. 
When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethpage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say this, the Lord needs it and will send it back immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Friends, please rise as you are able as we join together in our prayer of confession. Why do we set down our palm branches so quickly when the parade is over? When do our hosannas become cries for punishment? How do we, like those before us, turn our backs on the one who comes in the name of the Lord? As we begin Holy Week, let us take some time to admit to God what is true about our lives, taking comfort that God can transform even our egregious transgressions. Let us pray. God, who we encounter in both the palm procession and on the cross, when things go well for us, we can easily sing loud hosannas. But all too often, our songs of praise turn to ashes in mouths full of anger and bitterness. All too often, we hide behind our palm branches, hoping you will not see how we abandon one another and betray you and, and our ways. We eagerly feast on your blessings, but are often reluctant to share our good fortune with those around us. Forgive us, holy God. May we be as eager to lay down our fears and greed, our sins and pride, as your followers long ago were eager to lay down their coats for you. In Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen. Holy and ever-loving God, you assure us that nothing, not even the killing of your beloved Son, can separate us from your love. Each day and night, may we remember your love in our lying down and in our rising up, in life and in death. You are our healing and our peace. Each day and each night, may we remember your forgiveness and mercy bestowed on us so gently and generously. Each day and each night, may we be fuller in love with you. Amen. Let us now offer one another a sign of Christ's peace.
Hi, do I have any young friends that would like to join me? Hi, guys. Hi, friends, come on up. Find a seat, please. Oh, thank you for joining us as well. <laughs> John, do you want to come up? No rush, man. Hi, come on up. Okay. <sighs> so, this week I have been invited to grow, and it was uncomfortable. Many times this week I was confronted by bias that I have. Do you guys know what bias is? It means to feel discomfort at something we deem as other. Bias, this discomfort at the other. And man, was I uncomfortable this week. I felt like a bug that was too big for its exoskeleton. I got all squirmy and itchy and I had to grow. I had to come out of my exoskeleton and be something a little bit new on the other side. Does that ever happen to you? You make a mistake and you instantly feel uh, uh, uh. Does that ever happen to any of you? Oh, awesome possum. Well, when that does happen to you, that might be your conscience or the Holy Spirit moving through you to be like, hey, there's something we need to work on. And I think that living a Christian life is constantly being confronted by, by that discomfort, by the other. Christ is always inviting us to look at people that aren't like us or don't share our belief and invite them in. Even amongst his disciples, they would say, and I'm going to paraphrase, <laughs> why do we need to talk to them? The kingdom of God is for everyone, he would say, and let's invite them in. He would walk among the sick, the outcast, the lonely, and invite them in. And people around him would say, you're the son of God. Why do you need to hang out with the poor and the lepers? He said, so what? I am not above them. We are not above them. Living a Christian life is constantly being confronted by things that make us uncomfortable, make us squirmy in our own skin maybe, or at least for me. I find it difficult sometimes, a lot of the time actually, to walk in Christ's way because it's uncomfortable. Ugh, it can be uncomfortable to look at people that aren't like us or don't share our beliefs and to say, hmm, come in, sit with me a while, and also to sit with ourselves and be like, why did that, why did that make me uncomfortable? Ugh. What do you guys think? Oh, you're so quiet today. That's okay. It can be uncomfortable to be asked a direct question. So I want you guys to go out today and think of what opportunities do you have to change and grow? Because you guys are changing and growing all the time and getting new ideas. And you can help your grown-ups change and grow, too. Thanks so much for coming up.
as we step into this holiest of weeks in the Christian calendar, I often ask myself, so what? What kind of real life difference do the events of Jesus' triumphant entrance into Jerusalem, the Last Supper, his betrayal, trial, and crucifixion make in our lives? As we start out, the, the palm procession is, is irony at its finest. In it, we, we find not only Jesus' majesty, but also the fickleness of crowds. We get the setup for the fact that all too often crowds draw us from righteousness to unrighteousness in, in what seems like a blink of an eye. And then, without even being able to catch our breath, we step into Christ's passion, the church word used to wrap our, our, around Jesus' betrayal, trial, and crucifixion. This year, we've asked a series of readers to offer scripture passages from Jesus' passion, followed by meditations on how that scripture intersects with our lives, and follow that up with a prayer. I hope that you'll find it moving and perhaps provocative, maybe even a little bit uncomfortable. Jesus' passion and the fact that we're still hearing similar melodies today should make us uncomfortable. And it shouldn't end there. May that discomfort draw us into aligning ourselves more fully with Jesus Christ and with God's way of peace, joy, justice, and love. To deepen our experience of Holy Week and more fully enter and enjoy the Easter celebration, I've also created a sheet which can be found in your bulletins, the yellow sheet, on which you may choose to journal about these last phrases spoken by Jesus and their meaning for you. With that, I invite you to listen to this year's meditations at the foot of the cross. In the Gospel of Luke, we read, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Luke 23, verse 34. And I read that um, in a calm, peaceful way. But you might imagine that he was fighting for breath at that moment to say those words and forgive people as he was dying. Even as he is wrongfully accused, convicted, and tortured, Jesus asks God to grant mercy onto his prosecutors. What's more, the forgiveness of God through Christ doesn't come only to those who don't know what they're doing when they sin. In the mercy of God, we receive forgiveness, even when we know that what we do is wrong. God wipes away our faults, sins, and failings, not because we have some convenient excuse and not because we have tried hard to make up for them, but because we worship a God of amazing grace with mercies that are eternal and new every morning. And so we ask, are there people in your life for whom you need to offer forgiveness? Are there people from whom you need to seek forgiveness? How can Jesus' witness of forgiveness inspire our practice of forgiveness? That was a mouthful. <laughs> How can you find it in your heart to get past the injustice and cruelty that you may have suffered? Think about how forgiveness can free your heart and help you move forward. Please join with me in prayer. Loving and merciful God, thank you for this radical witness of forgiveness. May the concept that Jesus called for forgiveness, even amidst such profound suffering, affect how I understand forgiveness in my own life. Holy One, though I already believe at some level that you have forgiven me, this amazing truth needs to penetrate my heart in new ways. Help me to know that with fresh conviction that I am fully forgiven, not because of anything that I have done, but because of who you are. 
May I live today as a forgiven and forgiving person. Amen. read in the Gospel of Luke that Jesus said, Amen I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. As Jesus hung on the cross, he was mocked by the leaders and the soldiers. One of the criminals being crucified with him added his own measure of scorn, but the other crucified criminal sensed that Jesus was being treated unjustly. After speaking up for Jesus, he cried out, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus responded to this criminal, I assure you today, you will be with me in paradise. The text of Luke gives us no reason to believe that this man had been a follower of Jesus or even a believer in him in any way or well-developed sense. He might have felt sorry for his sins but the scriptures say nothing about him repenting. Rather, the criminal's cry can be to be remembered seems more like a desperate last gasp effort. Though it is noble to make every effort to have good theology, and though we strive to live our lives each day as disciples of Jesus, in the end, we are welcome in God's eternal embrace, not because we have good theology, and not because we are living rightly, but because God is merciful. Thanks be to God. This reflection spurs the questions. What comes first? Repentance, mercy, or forgiveness? The passage suggests that the order might, need, might not be as direct and clear as some would suggest. How can God's merciful nature inspire you? Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, how I wonder at your grace and mercy. When we cry out to you, you hear us. Your mercy, dear Lord, exceeds anything we might imagine. It embraces us, encourages us, heals us. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus, remember me today as I seek to live within your kingdom. Amen. Amen. Gospel of John, we read of Jesus saying, Woman, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. As Jesus was dying, his mother was among those who had remained with him. Most of the male disciples had fled, with the exception of one whom the Gospel of John calls the disciple Jesus loved. We do not know who the beloved disciple was, but nevertheless, it's clear that Jesus was forging a relationship between this disciple and his mother, one in which the disciple and Mary would take care of each other. Jesus wanted to make sure they would be in good hands after his death. The presence of Mary at the cross adds both humanity and horror to the scene. We are reminded that Jesus was a real human being, a man who had once been a child, who had once been carried in the womb of his mother. Even as he was dying on the cross, Jesus was also a son. When we think of the crucifixion of Jesus from the perspective of his mother, 
our horror increases dramatically. The death of a child is one of the most painful of all parental experiences. To watch one's beloved child experience the extreme torture of crucifixion must have been unimaginably terrible. This scene helps us not to glorify or spiritualize the crucifixion of Jesus. He was a real man, true flesh and blood, a son of a mother dying with unbearable agony. His suffering was altogether real. Some questions to think about. What does this passage stir up in you? How might we care for one another amidst life's trauma and grief? Let us pray. Lord Jesus, the presence of your mother at the cross engages my heart. My words fall short. As we contemplate Mary's experience at the foot of the cross, we take time to lift up our prayers for all parents who have suffered the death of a child and for all people who suffer trauma. May they know your grace and love, even as they suffer unfathomable pain. Amen. Both the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Mark tell us that Jesus cried, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus, at his his most human, calls out in anguish from the cross. He is in profound pain and abandoned by most of his friends. He echoes the beginning of Psalm 22, which reads, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why are you so far away when I groan for help? Every day I call to you, my God, but you do not answer. Every night you hear my voice, but I find no relief. In the words of the psalmist, Jesus found a way to express the cry of his heart, Why had God abandoned him? What does Jesus' cry of abandonment do in your own heart? When have you felt abandoned by family, friends, or even God? In what ways can you relate to Jesus? Join me in prayer. O Lord Jesus, Though I will never fully grasp the wonder and horror, horror, your feeling of abandonment, every time I read this, I'm overwhelmed. I thirst. One of the remaining words Jesus shared from the Gospel of John, chapter 19, verse 28. Here Jesus once again expresses a human need. No doubt Jesus experienced extreme thirst while being crucified. He would have lost a substantial amount of bodily fluid, both blood and sweat, from what he had endured leading up to his crucifixion. Thus, his statement, I am thirsty, was, on the most obvious level, a request for something to drink. In response, the soldiers gave Jesus sour wine, a cheap beverage common in that time. 
As we reflect on Jesus' statement, I am thirsty, we are also moved to think of our own thirst. Though nothing like that of Jesus, our souls yearn for the living water that Jesus offers. In a reflection on this, for what are you thirsting? How can you strengthen your faith life to quench that thirst? When have you felt distressed and cried out for what you needed? Who came to your aid? Where was God during your suffering? In prayer, dear Lord, in your words, I am thirsty. I hear the cry of my own heart. I too am thirsty, Lord, not for physical drink. I don't need sour wine. Rather, I need to be refreshed by your living water. I yearn for your spirit to fill me once again. I am thirsty, Lord, for you. Amen. In the Gospel of John, the last thing Jesus says before he dies is, it is finished. The United Church of Christ has a famous tagline, never place a period where God has placed a comma. It's attributed to Gracie Allen, the famous actress and comedian. But in this scripture, Jesus is placing a period, full stop. The question becomes, what is finished? To be sure his earthly suffering was coming to an end. Humanity had done their worst to him. The betrayal by one of his nearest and dearest the abandonment by so many of the rest, the travesty of justice, the experience of being used as a political pawn, all of that was coming to an end. When Jesus was murdered, his earthly body breathed its last. It is finished. It is a stark reminder that sin and violence and domination and manipulation have consequences. But the story doesn't end there. The late Bishop Oscar Romero wrote, when they kill me, my blood will sow the seeds of liberation. Today we sit with the consequences of sin, even as our faith promises that death will not have the last word. For reflection, when have you experienced the consequences of your sin? Has the light of Christ penetrated that darkness yet? We pray. Holy God, help me to face my faults and sins honestly, that I might also experience the grace of rising to new life with you.
In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus' final words are, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Two of the last seven words of Jesus were quotations from the Psalms. Earlier, we heard of Jesus quoting Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? The Gospel of Luke borrows, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit, from Psalm 31. On an obvious level, Jesus was putting his post-mortem future in the hands of God. It was as if he was saying, whatever happens next is up to you, O God. Sometimes called the verse of reunion, in this sentence, Jesus is proclaiming that while his earthly life is finished, union with God is where he will return. Because we have read ahead, we know that while this seems like the very end, it is only just the beginning. By quoting Psalm 31, Jesus entrusted his future to God. No, God would not deliver him from death by crucifixion, but beyond this horrific death lay something profound. Our previous reflection acknowledged the consequences of our sins and failings. How does the prospect of being united with God offer hope? In hindsight, what endings in your life have actually been beginnings? Let us pray. Gracious Lord, even as you once entrusted your spirit to God, so we give our lives to you. Help us to trust in you, both now and in the future. As we reflect upon your death, may it not be in despair, but in hope, with Easter on the horizon. Amen. Having reflected on each of Jesus' final statements individually, let us reflect on how the messages all work together to create a prayer. Just as he was a model for us in life, so Jesus was in death, teaching us how to pray through our darkest hours and reminding us that God is always listening. Fortified by the knowledge of God's unfailing mercy, may we have the strength we need to go forward as God's Easter people. May it be so. Amen. Jesus.
Let us join our hearts and minds in prayer once more. God of paradox, you call us to sit these coming days in the heart of betrayal, abandonment, mockery, violence, to not avert our eyes, but to see ourselves in the story. Travel with us into the border spaces of unknowing, the places and ways of being that hold death and life. the liminal realm of in-between. Accompany us as we feel the suffering and loss of Jesus. Let us not rush to resurrection just yet, but linger a while. In this temple of grief, strip us of our attachments, the identities we cling to, the securities we believe in. Disorient us that we might walk in a new direction. Lift the veils that dull our senses from the world's sorrow. Give us courage to ask questions rather than demand answers. Let us carve a space within us to let love pour into the chalice which is each one of our hearts. Bring us into communion with all those who suffer. Suffer from Poverty, hunger, war, abuse, climate crisis, pollution, clear-cutting, loneliness, abandonment, the whole creation groaning. Inspire us to labor together, keeping our eyes and ears and hearts open for you. For with you, even when death seems to have one new possibility, one only dimly seen in quiet moments, a glimmer in the eyes, a song in the throat, is possible. Help us to see and hear and wait with the horrors, even as we trust in your wisdom and mercy and love. In a special way today, we join our hearts and minds in prayer with those in Gaza and Palestine. as horror is all too real. We pray with Carolyn Johnson and her daughters, Heather and Kayla, as they mourn the death of their husband and father, Lonnie Johnson. We pray for Barb Strom and her family as Barb enters hospice. We pray with Jessica Lundgren and Libby Seifert and their family as Jessica's mom undergoes treatment for cancer. We pray with David and Nancy Seward and 
in gratitude as David's cancer treatments conclude. With Kenny Devoki amidst his cancer treatment, with John Krieger, Lee, Gloria Kamenicki's cousin, Kim Janusek's sister, and all of our members who are asking for prayers for friends and loved ones. We pray for foster families, birth families, adoptive families, and everyone who seeks to positively impact the lives of children. For those who struggle with addiction and their families and loved ones. For those who struggle with depression and other mental health concerns. We pray for the unemployed, the underemployed, and those who struggle with poverty. God, who has endured the very worst this world can offer, we offer you these prayers. The prayers of my lips and the prayers of all of our hearts, trusting Christ's message that death and sin and pain do not have the last word. In, with, and through Jesus, we humbly pray. Amen. Having lifted up our prayers of this day, we join our voices with Christians across the world and across the centuries as we pray to you, our God, who are both our mother and our Father, who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Gracious God, in this holiest of weeks, we ask you to inspire our generosity once more, that moved by Christ's love, Christ's death, and Christ's resurrection. We might contribute our resources, our time, our talents, our very beings to the building up of your reign. In Jesus' name, we humbly pray. Amen.
Let us pray. God of triumphant parades and the desolate cross, we offer you thanks and praise at the start of this holiest week. Attune our attentions to your grace. Help us to embody the stories of our ancestors once more, that by worshiping and celebrating you, our lives and your world may be ever closer to your kingdom. Bless these offerings and all of the ways we live our faith. Blessed Jesus, may our resources, our lives, and our observation of these sacred rhythms bring your beloved world ever closer to you. Amen.
Friends, this worship may be ending, but our service is just beginning. As we steal away to Jesus, may we unite ourselves with his passion that we might also be part of his rising. Friends, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.